Okay, so people are on the road to get their Linux machine. So the first thing we do is basic port scanning with Go. And so here's my Linux machine. And uh, to install Go, you download a version here. I've updated this to point to the latest version. And you can verify the SHA sum. This is an old fashioned, not very secure way to improve, to uh, enforce the accuracy of something. You put on the website a hash value starting with 9.5, as you see there. And you can calculate the hash value of the thing you download and see that it's 9.5. The reason this is not very secure is somebody could hack into the server, replace the file, and replace this hash value. That's why it's a whole lot better to actually sign your code and then verify the signature. But anyway, this is what people did for quite a while. Anyway, uh, then you just unzip that thing and execute a few command line commands, and you will end up with Go. You can run Go on a all platforms, of course, but I just wrote these instructions for Linux, and it's easier if people use that operating system. But uh, the only difference between doing it on Linux and doing it on other platforms is what text editor you use, and perhaps something about the folder structure. So I'm following a um, general tutorial here, which prepares you to write software more professionally than I usually do. I usually write simple one file programs and compile them with like a C compiler. But here, the tutorial I based this on, had you do what you're supposed to do in the modern world is prepare yourself with a special directory for each project so you can have a whole series of source files in there. So you make a directory for each project and then you put your code deeply in that subdirectory like this. So I'm just using that, which is a little bit of overkill, but it works. It just means I have to create a directory for each project and then put it in this work source, my project, the name of the program, and then the name of the program dot go. So this is where everybody always starts. Hello world. You have um, a package main. This is like the main routine in C. And then you have to import libraries you're going to use the same as include files in C if you're used to them. So I'm going to need the format file so I can do a format print F. So I have a print statement. And now I can print hello world followed by a carriage return. So that's all there is to that. And to compile it, you do go install my project hello, which I've already done. And then you run it with just hello. And so it prints hello world. So that just shows that your go is working. So then more fun is to make a port scanner. And I've already added these to this machine. So I'll just open them to look at them. All right, so port scanner is here. And let me make my font a little bigger. All right, so again, we have a main package just to get going. Now we import several things, format so we can print and net and string converge. And so we make a main function here. And now I have a loop, uh, which goes from one to 65, 535, or it looks like one less than 65, 535. And for each of those, it's going to take a port and convert it to a string in base 10, uh, taking the integer i and formatting as a string. Then it's going to do this. It's going to take 127001, the local host, colon, and add my port number as a string. And it's going to connect to that with TCP. And that uses the net dial function, which makes a TCP connection. And that's going to return two values, connection and error. The connection will point will be the handle to the connection so you can control it. And the error is, of course, an error message if there is an error. And if error is nil, then it did not have an error. And then you do this stuff, which is print that port is open and then close. One thing to notice about Go is these colons here. When you use a variable for the first time, you put a colon there, which means create this variable. If you refer to it again, like here or here, you don't include the colon because it's not new anymore. So that's one somewhat odd syntax thing about Go. Anyway, then you can compile that one and run it with port scan one. And as you see, it scans 65,000 ports really fast because it's scanning my local machine. And the machine, ports open on your local machine might vary a bit. That's what I've got on mine, but I've got random junk installed on mine. 
they'll always see port 22 open, but they may see different ones. So all this does is try to connect to ports. And if it can't connect, it just does nothing. Now, you might want one that will grab the banner of the port. If it does connect, it will look to see if the port returns a banner explaining what service it is. So that's this one, the same imported libraries. And I'm only going to go from ports 20 to 25 this time. And now I do the same thing, except instead of connecting to my local host, I connect to one of my test machines, target1.boundconsulting.com. I scan it. And now if the error is nil, then I print the port is open. And now I define a buffer with room for 1,024 bytes. And I read. And again, it puts it in, this returns the number of bytes read and the error, and it puts the bytes in that buffer. So if error is nil, then it prints that I got a banner and here's the banner. So that's a banner grabber, which is typically what you think of as a port scanner like Nmap. If it finds an open port, it doesn't just tell you it's open, it tells you more information about it. So that's port scan two. All right, and see it found port 22 open, and then it downloaded the banner, which is the SSH banner, which is part of the SSH protocol. When people connect, you're supposed to print it out and continues, and then it stops. So that's fine. And now um, the third one is going to be port scan three. And I'll just go up here to my nano and go to port scan three. Just have to change it in two places. All right. So this one is going to scan more ports. It's exactly like the last one, except I'm going to go from port 20 up to port 30, or really, I think, to port 29. So let's try that. Port scan three. Okay, what happens is it hits port 25 and never returns. Now, this is because port 25 is SMTP, and there's, this server is apparently listening on port 25, but port 25 has no banner. It's not intended to be used this way. So this program is waiting for data to come that is never coming. And it's waiting for some default timeout, which is very long, like two minutes or something. So that's no fun. And to overcome that problem, you want to institute a timeout on your connection. So that's what this one has. Now, when you connect, it adds another parameter here. It uses, instead of using dial, it uses dial timeout. Here's the protocol. Here's the target uh, domain name and port number. And here's the timeout. It's only going to wait one second before giving up. So that should do it. And so let's run that port scan four. And now time 25 timed out. And it didn't make me wait too long for the timeout. So that's good. And uh, I, I guess I what this probably means is this port is filtered. It doesn't return an act to a, a sin act to a sin, and it doesn't return a reset. It must be filtered by a firewall. That's what makes this uh, freeze up your scanner. So those are a few elegant things of a scanner. And now you've got some uh, some flags to find. So one of them is an error message just you get from running uh, the program we just made. And then there are some challenges. You search on various servers for various ports to find banners. And then there's a somewhat more difficult challenge where you connect to a server and it then returns some data and you're going to have to put that data in a string and parse it to find the second port and then connect. So uh, there's a, those port, a simple form of port knocking where when you first connect, it gives you a number and you have to read that number and automatically connect to a second port to get the banner. So give those things a try and we'll see how it goes.